So thank you very much all for coming. And uh, indeed, I'm here to tell you about uh, this new book, um, which uh, is called The Life of Super Earth. And I will come back to the meaning and the double meaning of this title at the end, towards the end of my presentation now. Uh, it is about two developments in science, uh, one in astronomy, one in biology. And it is about the unlikely marriage that is about to bring something new, both to science and, I think, in a certain sense, beyond science. This is one of the motivations I had writing this book and writing it for a general audience. The other one is because I realized that there was something which I had missed in my studies and my work in science. And it is, I will read something to you which will bring about the reasoning behind and the motivation behind this book. Because it is more than just the scientific results which have been published over the years in technical journals. But it's something which relates to each and every one of us. What I'm going to read to you is a couple of paragraphs which were written by one of my favorite science fiction writers, Arthur C. Clarke. He wrote that in uh, the 70s, in fact, right about 1975, following uh, a book uh, written by the physicist Freeman Dyson, who was then summarizing what we knew about stellar evolution, how stars uh, and their cycles go on into the universe in a way in which more and more of the smaller reddish stars are formed as the universe ages. But in the 70s, scientists knew very little about the big picture of the universe. We had seen only a fraction of it. And we knew little about uh, the past and by inference about the future of the universe. However, Arthur C. Quark, in a sense, prophetically thought about what that future could be. This is what he wrote about it. He said, not for billions of years will the real history of the universe begin. It will be a history illuminated only by the reds and infrareds of dully glowing stars that would be almost invisible to our eyes. Yet the somber hues of that all but eternal universe may be full of color and beauty to whatever strange beings have adapted to it. They will know that before them lie years to be counted literally in trillions. They will have time enough in those endless eons to attempt all things and to gather all knowledge. They will be like gods because no gods imagined by our minds have ever possessed the powers they will command. But for all that, they will envy us basking in the bright afterglow of creation, for we knew the universe when it was young. For all that, they will envy us because we knew the universe when it was young. This is what I read four years ago. I never read it when he wrote it in the 70s. And apart from the poetry, uh, he wrote very beautifully, as those of you who have read um, his novels, no. There was something very true, ring very true to me, because those 40 years between the time he wrote this and what we knew about stellar evolution, and today, four years ago when I read that, we had learned a lot about the universe, the bigger universe uh, that is out there. And in a sense, we had understood some of what he was talking about in real terms, not only as possibilities, but as something which, was, which now is part of our scientific toolkit, understanding the formation of structure in the universe. And in that understanding of structure in the universe, pictures like this one, which are thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, just uh, less, than a year, uh, less than two years ago, this is the ultra-deep Hubble field, which essentially gives you uh, one pencil beam look as far possible as we could have ever seen, essentially to the first galaxies that are there in the observable universe. And because of the fact that light travels at a limited speed, this is also a picture in time 
essentially geological layers of time uh, going back 13, almost 13 billion years from the present to today. And that picture, as opposed to in the 70s, is now quite clearly developed by 40 years of uh, experiments, observations, and work by the whole astronomical community, which is one of the biggest, I would say, one of the biggest um, scientific uh, accomplishments of the 20th century. So even though we don't know much about that first fraction of a second or the first even uh, minute and before that, which we generally call the Big Bang, what I'm talking about and what we actually know very well is this period of time here, from very early on to the present. These individual stages in the evolution, in the aging of the young universe we live in, are now well observed. 40 years ago, this stage, which goes all the way back, was never observed. There was an expectation that it was there. Now we observe it very well. And what we know about the universe back then is that there were no stars, there were no galaxies, there was only hydrogen and helium. What we know about the universe today is that it has a lot of stars, which started soon after the gas cooled. But we know a lot more. We know that stars started forming fast, peaked about five billion years ago, and are now no longer forming as fast as they used to. Planets were not forming when the first stars formed because the f stars were necessary to produce the heavy elements from which all of us and our planet is made of. And planets, unlike stars, continue to form. What we live in in the present is a universe in which smaller stars form and a lot of planets are forming as well. What we know by going back is that we can project into the future. And in fact, we can project into the future not a mere 10 or 20 billion years ahead. We can project 100 billion years ahead. And we still know that what we see as the universe today, the present day universe, is going to be in general terms the same. That is what is the big accomplishment of the last 20 years. So if you Think about the universe, the observable universe, in those terms. You now understand why I call it a young universe. Because all that needed to happen has already happened for it to come to a mature state. And that mature state, and that's in physical terms, if you want, a dynamical mature state, is now going on to coast for many more periods of time that have elapsed so far hundreds of billions of years into the future. So what uh, Arthur C. Clarke was saying, we knew the universe when it was young, now we know is actually correct in terms of the dynamical state of this universe. And what is really interesting here is, of course, he was talking about us, uh, some kind of sentient beings. We don't know about that. We don't know to what extent we a part of this universe yet, and to what extent that will be part of its future. But what we are seeing is that life may be part of the recent past and present, and it appears to be an important part of the future of this dynamical state of a young universe. And that puts a different perspective on what we call life. And this is the perspective I wanted to bring to you in my book, because I was trying to look into something which is the domain of biology with the eyes of an astronomer who has actually gone through this transformation in astronomy in the last 20 years, essentially from being a graduate student in Toronto to today. And that brings me to the topic in the title of the book, Super Earth, which is simply a type of planet, a new type of planet, which is very plentiful in this present universe and which has the properties that make it essential to the question that I'm asking here. What is the place of the phenomenon we call life in this bigger picture? And hence, it is in the title. Super Earth 
are indeed what the name implies, planets which are lar larger than the Earth, but only slightly so. Uh, this is a recent gallery of them. You can see three of those with their de designations. Two of them are Kepler planets discovered by the NASA mission Kepler, Kepler 10b, Kepler 9d. One of them is by the French mission Corot, Corot 7b. There is the Earth and Venus there for comparison. And as you can see, we've already discovered planets uh, the size of the Earth as well. So there is a whole continuum here. It's a whole family of uh, these planets. There is also a question <laughs> which people ask me, well, why do astronomers call those planets super Earth? And that's sometimes in physics and astronomy a difficult question to answer because we in science sometimes name things just for ease of use and then um, don't pay much attention. And then years later, we may be sorry about it. But in this case, <laughs> who knows? So I want to actually tell you a little bit more about this, because tonight we are in the place where some of this story unfolded in the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And uh, it happened about 12 years ago, almost 13 years ago here, with um, two colleagues of uh, mine who I knew very well and who unfortunately both passed away. Uh, and who at the time came up with a very exciting idea. In 1999, a group of us, mostly at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and mostly observers and engineers, came together to propose to NASA an innovative space telescope designed for planet detection with a square mirror as opposed to a round one. There it is there. This green thing is the square mirror. And that was the trick. All telescopes, all telescopes from the time of Galileo have always had round lenses or round mirrors. This one was different. My colleagues, Costas Paleolius and Peter Nissensen, had invented this unusual design in order to minimize stellar glare and allow glimpses of planets huddled close to their stars. With a team of about 20 and led by our experienced space mission scientist, Gary Melnick, we prepared a detailed scientific and engineering proposal. And you see a page of it here. My job on the team, as a junior team member at the time, was to work out what kind of planets our telescope might be able to discover. So I, I didn't do any of this stuff. I was just dreaming up the planets. It seemed then that super-Earths were in reach. I like to call them super-Earths and super-Venuses for short, as it had been common in astronomy to use the adjective super for newly discovered or hypothesized objects that are larger in size or energy than known ones. For example, stars that are larger than giant stars are called supergiants, or explosions that are stronger than novae are called supernovae, and so on. The shorthand stuck, and you've probably already surmised that this is how the whole thing started. In fact, the funny thing is I all forgot about it. And then a French astronomer who collects the history of exoplanet research reminded me about six years ago about this, that this was the design which first used those words, super-Earths and super-Venuses. And um, it was not approved. Uh, it's never been realized in practice. It may be because I think it's a great design uh, one day that it will fly and it will discover and study planets. What is special about this is it would not only discover the planets, but it will take the spectra of those planets. And we were excited about studying the atmospheres. In the meantime, that same year when this uh, proposal was turned down, another proposal in a different uh, category and a different div division of NASA was approved. And that proposal was for the Kepler Space Telescope, of which I was also uh, a team member. At the time, there were very few of us working on that, and we were team members on all the proposals. <laughs> there are not that many either. So this is the Kepler Space Telescope, which uh, on March 9th will be exactly three years in space. And for the past three years, it has managed to bring us a beautiful 
uh, tally of planets, from very large planets, from planets very far from their stars, to planets uh, as small as the Earth, Kepler 20f and Kepler 20e. Uh, most of the work in the Kepler team on this particular two planets was done here in this building. Francois Fressin is uh, the young fellow who did uh, most of the work here in the paper. And these two planets, uh, for the first time, that humanity achieved the technological feat of reaching to the point where we could discover and study planets the size of our own around other stars. And um, Kepler actually has gone further than that. But uh, just to tell you what this family of super Earths and Earth sized planets looks like, they often come in company. Kepler 20 is how we call this particular star. And E and F stand for consecutive planets discovered about it. And you can already tell that probably there is B, C, and D, like there is Kepler 10b here. Well, yes, indeed, this planetary system has five planets. Uh, and uh, they go as follows. There is a very large planet outside. Then there is the Earth-sized planet comes next uh, with a period smaller than that of Mercury, then there is another Neptune-sized planet, then the little rocky planet, which is like Venus, comes next. And then there is the Super Earth, the rocky planet, which is even closer to its parent star. So that's, that's what the planetary system Kepler-20 looks like. <coughs> A beautiful, compact system, which was amazing to discover because all of these five planets are passing in front of their star or as we call that, transit. So Kepler, which is using that method, managed to detect them. But this is the kind of planetary systems which we have been detecting in the past couple of years. And only in the past year, we already have about 300 candidate systems like this, uh, going up to 350. So we are not talking about one or two. We're talking about hundreds of such systems already. And that's what Kepler has really brought to us. And just uh, uh, few weeks ago, last month, there was even another Kepler discovery which found a system with three planets which are even smaller than Venus itself. Now, there is Kepler 20f and Kepler 20e. We just talked about them. There is our own Earth. And there you have it, three planets which uh, the smallest one is almost the size of Mars. So technically, with the help of space telescope like this one, Kepler, we are now able to do that. You would ask, well, OK, how exactly is that done? Uh, you've probably heard uh, about the transiting method of planet detection if you've been here before. But basically, Kepler is a large digital camera which takes pictures. It's one part of the sky in the constellation Cygnus. And it looks at about 150,000 stars simultaneously all the time without interruption, waiting for some of them to dim regularly. And they dim because they happen to have planets that are oriented in such a way that from time to time they will eclipse, or as we say, transit their parent stars. And that's how we discover them. And then we have to do some more work in order to confirm them. Transits are actually well known to humanity for centuries. Uh, and there is something special about this year, 2012. It's not the Mayan calendar. It's on this picture. Can you see something special, unusual about this picture? Well, you're, you're a very knowledgeable audience. Yes, this is not a cloud. Neither it is a sunspot. It is the planet Venus in 2004, seen at sun sunrise uh, from the eastern seaboard here, with some cl clouds uh, from North Carolina, particularly this picture. I remember seeing it. Uh, it was a beautiful event. And what is special about today, this year is that you should put June 5th in your calendars and try to observe the transit of Venus, which is happening this year. And it's the last one this century. We'll be observing it here a special program. You can come here and observe it upstairs from the roof. I, I definitely recommend it. It's not only because. The next time this happens is in the 22nd century, <laughs> a very long time from now, but also because it's a beautiful event. And we'll tell you something about where this whole 
field is going. And it is this kind of technology that we can use today, and which was exciting to people three centuries ago when they first observed the transit of Venus, that is bringing half of that uh, new development in science that I'm talking about. The, the half which is about planets and which comes from astronomy. And already with the results which we have from the Kepler mission and other uh, space telescopes, we can actually see the place of the Earth simply in the distribution of those different planets that we discover. And what we see is that there is an entire distribution, a spectrum of planets, let's call them all super Earths, because most of them are actually slightly bigger than the Earth, of which the Earth is part of. And then you go to the smaller and smaller planets like Mars. And as I will try to convince you here, they are a different breed altogether. So this is the family of planets to which our own Earth belongs for a number of reasons. And so in a sense, we see so many of those super Earths now orbiting other stars that the question about are there other planets which resemble in their surface conditions those that we have here on our own is very close to being answered. I would say this is the year when it's going to be answered. Towards the end of 2012, Kepler is probably going to finally have the uh, results uh, that statistically show you that Earth is a multitude of Earths and we'll have the number which we can say in our galaxy that is how often these kind of planets occur, form and occur and are currently present uh, as a whole. So that is part of the story. The other story of course is about the Earth which we all know and we call it life. And so the question is what about life? Is there any connection between what we are discovering out there and what we may hope to learn about the basic nature of what we call life? And I really want to emphasize here, we use the word life for, to mean many things. Dolce Vita, good life, bad life, and so on. I really want to uh, call life here biochemistry. That is what I want to refer to is the basic chemistry of what we call life. And indeed, if you want to connect what we learned from our own solar system, our own planet Earth, to what we might understand about life, you have to work at the level of the basic chemistry. And um, I would argue, and I do argue in my book, is that this is the only way in which we could make some small progress towards the bigger questions. And the bigger questions is what is the nature of life. So you may ask, well, what is the definition then of life? We don't have a definition of life. We don't understand its basic nature. And so it may be then uh, foolish to go out and say, well, if we don't understand what is life, so why do we even try to look for it? Um, is there any hope that we may be able to discover life on other planets, even if those other planets are just Mars next door, which we are trying actively to do? There is some hope, and the hope we have and at least we should make our best to do that, is with what we call remote sensing. What we learned in the 20th century is how to do remote sensing very well. What remote sensing is, is to be able to detect gases, like oxygen gas emitted by the green stuff here is what we're trying to discover, and that bubble is what may tell us that it is there. Biosignature gases is the particular gases, in this case, free oxygen, which can dissipate in the atmosphere of, an, uh, of a planet and accumulate there over a sufficiently long period of time that with our tools of remote sensing, which we generally call spectroscopy, we have a chance of detecting them. And we, if we really understand the geochemistry of the planet, that kind of disequilibrium between a gas which shouldn't be there, and it could be mapped back to something which is really not in organic chemistry, but biochemistry, is our only hope to be able to detect those signatures remotely. That, that's what we call remote sensing. And when we talk about remote sensing, you would say, but could you even achieve that for those very distant planets? 
And the answer three years ago is, yes, we think we can do that. The answer today is we have already achieved that for one. And that is the Super Earth GJ1214b, which is a relatively newly discovered and nearby uh, Super Earth. It was discovered here in this building by a project called MERS. Dave Serbonneau is the principal of that project. It uh, is a Super Earth which is fairly large and is not one for which we would uh, consider life as an option. But the reason I'm showing it here to you, and I apologize for the many wiggles, I'll explain them in a minute, is because this tells you that we have the techniques, the tools, the technology to go out and look for those biosignature gases. What is it that I'm showing you here? I'm showing you spectra, what we call the distribution of colors in the light coming from this particular planet. So as you know, uh, if we can measure the light from the planet and measure it in different colors, wavelengths, as they had given here in microns, where this is where we would call the visual band, what we see with our eyes, and at one micron and beyond is the infrared, what we uh, experience as heat, but we need uh, special detectors, infrared detectors, to measure. What you see here with black symbols are the actual measurements. Jacob Bean and uh, Jean-Michel Desert, both young people from here, did these measurements. What you see in those colorful wiggles are actual theoretical models. Most of them were developed by Eliza miller ricky who was a student here as well. And they give you the different theoretical expectations for different uh, planetary models with different amounts of water. Most of those are signatures of water in the atmosphere. Some of those here are signatures of methane. And others there are signatures of carbon dioxide. So this is the first step. And as the first step, as the first baby step, it's very insecure and not very good. You would say, well, you have a lot more work to do. Yes, we do. The reason I'm showing you this is that it is not science fiction. We can actually do this already. And this is the first time it was done. And as you can see here, 2010, 2011, it was done last year. So it is not. But that's not the whole story. We go there, measure many of those planets. We well, maybe measure the existence of carbon dioxide and water and methane. Uh, how would we know what exactly is happening? How would we know if we really are looking but not seeing what is a potential biosphere? We only know one example of life on Earth, and even that example is already giving us so many possibilities which we haven't explored yet. Even on our own planet, we have actually bacteria which don't produce oxygen but except produce methane. These are sulfur-loving bacteria, reddish in color, as opposed to the green ones from the previous picture. And this bubble now, uh, hardly visible here, is a bubble of methane. So this bacteria uh, produce methane. This methane could accumulate in the atmosphere if there was not so much oxygen in, in our own atmosphere. And we could again detect it in a distant way. But the problem here is that there is a big question which we haven't answered, which is, is life on other planets even Mars, the same as life on Earth. And remember, I mean biochemistry. Is the chemistry of that life the same? Should we expect? And I would say uh, it will be foolish to assume that, especially if we have done so little work here in the lab to answer that question. And that is a question which has to be answered in the lab by people who do chemical and molecular biology experiments. And this brings me to the other half of the scientific developments, partly because of the discovery of those exoplanets, partly because biology and chemistry are moving in this direction, and particularly biology is becoming a lot more quantitative, just like uh, some of these physical sciences, like physics and uh, chemistry. There is a new field which is now called, or has been called in the past year, chemical synthetic biology, which is essentially trying to prepare us with this homework 
and partly give people like me the opportunity to have a more intelligent uh, way of looking at those spectra once we get them in the next 10 years. And what synthetic, uh, chemical synthetic biology has as its main object of study is the concept of minimal cell. The min minimal cell is a, a chemical entity which has some of the functions which we, basic functions that we ascribe to life, like uh, replication, like metabolism, like um, um, catalytic uh, uh, control of chemical reactions. And if you allow me, just for one slide, I will uh, be technical here in order to convey to you what this is all about. So the slide is technical, but I hope you'll get the gist of the point here. Building an artificial minimal cell that is such a chemical entity can be done in two ways, a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. The top-down approach, let's start with it first, is kind of an obvious thing to do. You start with the smallest and simplest bacterial cells that you know of, that we know, or our friends biologists know, and try to reduce their genomes down to the minimal set of genes and still preserve those basic functions. So you select things like uh, my, mycoplasma, which is one of those with 528 genes. It's a very small number of genes. Until uh, 2009, three years ago, this was the smallest known. Uh, since 2009, there is one which is really a record holder, 188 genes only. It is uh, this uh, uh, parasite, which actually is a parasite inside cicadas, a particular type of cicadas. And because it's a parasite, it lives in a very sheltered environment, so it doesn't need many of the other genes which other bacteria need. So evolutionary, it has ended up with a very small number of genes. So these people have tried to take those organisms and with the tools of uh, synthetic genomics, or what generally is called genetic engineering, have tried to knock out genes. Uh, this is a well-known technique in uh, synthetic genomics. It's called knocking out genes, silencing genes, or knocking them out, literally chemically removing them, and trying to remove, so to say, the junk part, which they don't understand why it's there and maybe does nothing, and create a minimal cell which would fu still function, at least replicate itself. So this has been going on for 40 years now, and it's generally failed. It has failed to produce the minimal cell, but it's failed in a way which is very good in science. That is, people understand why they failed. They learned something out of this failure. And what they learned out of this failure is that even the simplest microbe on our planet, like this little uh, parasite there, has in its genome the heritage of millions of years and sometimes billions of years of existence. That is, it carries with it the trials and the tribulations of the geological times on our planet and how some organism on the tree of life has actually, uh, its predecessor essentially, has managed to survive through those periods. And this is quite often hidden in the part of the genetic code which we call, or used to call, junk DNA, which we didn't know what it actually does. And these small molecules which get activated if the organism is subject to some particular unexpected environmental change or a new uh, bacteria tries to eat it, for example. Most of these, in fact, have to do with competition between uh, organisms, not between the organism and the planetary environment. But you understand the problem here. If people like me want to know would the basic chemistry and the basic way in which life would develop and react on a planet which is different from Earth or the planets in the solar system, most of which are carbon cycle planets, this approach is not going to help us at all. Because we cannot, these uh, very simple microbes, they really are very far removed from uh, being uh, close to the planetary environment. There is a huge gap between even the smallest of those and 
what we would call a minimal cell or what we would call those minimal cells which will tell us anything about the planetary environment. So that's why the last five years people are trying the bottom-up approach. It's a completely different way. You start from scratch, building the molecules, which at least we know from the example of Earth life, are necessary for some of the basic functions. Yes, you're never going to be uh, as sophisticated even as the simplest of those, but maybe you will create a chemical system which will manage to perform two or three of some of those basic functions. But it will perform them in a way in which you can directly study how that chemistry relates to the environment, as opposed to here, where this kind of study is not possible. This became possible, not, I mean, George Church was the one who suggested it uh, six years ago, but it only became possible about two years ago when uh, it was for the first time possible to synthesize this nexus, which is a complex of molecules that form the so-called ribosomes, which are essential to, com to completing those, those basic cycles. And so people are now in the process of taking those synthesized molecules and putting them in enclosures. Uh, they're called vesicles or simple membranes, which have the form of cells and look like this under the microscope to actually uh, see what uh, will happen if you let those chemical reactions go on for a certain amount of time. And that is essentially asking a, a simpler question that the big question which I ask is life possibly different on other planets. Is it possible to build a minimal cell which has a different biochemistry or is biochemistry uh, universal the same way in which the laws of electromagnetism or the law of gravity is universal. In other words, would the outside conditions, whether they are the carbon cycle conditions or the sulfur cycle conditions, uh, really uh, require a different set of molecules? So the same molecules will do exactly the same functions with the same fideli fidelity. That is, we measure those rates and we can compare the two and see which one works and which doesn't. So this brings us back as to, well, so what, what have these planets have to do with all of this? If uh, you can do this in the uh, lab, just go ahead and do it. And of course, this needs to be done. But there is one bit which comes back from the planets into what we do in the lab. Of course, the first part is obvious. We, the astronomers, would like to learn from the biologists a little bit more of what to look for. But if you go back, you may ask, why look at these particular types of planets? What is, have you learned enough to say that they are special in some way? Special in the sense that they're different from planets which are smaller, like Mars, and they are different from planets which are bigger, like Jupiter and Saturn. The part which is about being smaller is easy. Uh, for a long time, people who have studied uh, the stability of the environments on on Earth and the planets in the solar system have pointed out that with the exception of the Earth, all the small rocky planets are unstable on geological time scale. They spin around their axis, but they tend to flip once in a while, maybe twice in a billion years. Mars does it about two times every billion years. And the reason they flip is because of the interactions with the other bigger planets. They're not stable enough. They don't have enough momentum to just spin as their top. The Earth is very unusual in that way because it's stabilized by the existence of a large moon. The moon acts as the stabilizing force. So there are many books written about how the Earth and life on Earth are very unique because of the unique existence of such a big moon. Such a big moon is not a common thing around other planets, or shouldn't be. Uh, it is a, a low probability event that you'll have this kind of... Uh, big moon so close to it. The answer why bigger planets are actually stable is obvious. If you're bigger, even if you're just two times more massive, you have so much more momentum that the interactions with the other planets are not going to uh, tip you over. So you have stable environments all, over long periods of time. The second part is if you have a large planet, you have a lot of heat inside it, and it keeps that heat longer. 
And we already know from the example of Mars, and certainly Mercury, that both of these planets are just too small to keep their heat reaching the surface. They've had very small windows of opportunity in the beginning of their existence when they were warm enough to have volcanoes and to have chemical exchange. Well, it is only the Earth, really, which has an active exchange between the interior, which is a large reservoir, untapped reservoir, if you will, of chemicals, of raw material, and of heat, and which reservoir has access to the surface because of the crust being dynamic, having both volcanoes and what we call plate tectonics, which essentially means that you have a lot of renewal and filtered access to that, uh, uh, to that reservoir, what we in science would call a cycle. That is, there is a, a cycle of certain major gases and chemical materials which come from below, come into the atmosphere, then rain down, uh, accumulate, transform chemically, then are subducted, re renewed again, and that happens once in a million years with a time scale of about a million years. This is a cycle that all of you have heard about. We call it the carbon cycle. And it is a cycle that today is co-opted by life, but it functions on a planet uh, just by itself. As long as there is activity, as long as there are volcanoes going on, and there is some way of replenishing and re recycling those materials. This is the carbon dioxide cycle, and this is the cycle which is uh, the only cycle that has happened here in our solar system. For Mars, for Venus, and Mercury is too small to have a cycle like that. So this kind of cycle determines what the chemical conditions on a given planet would be. It doesn't even matter how you started. What were the initial conditions for this planet? Whether the planet was slightly larger or slightly smaller, it had a large amount of maybe sulfur or carbon or nitrogen. Eventually, this cycling is going to drive the planet, as we say, drive it to an equilibrium. And that equilibrium has a very particular chemical environment. Globally, that planet, or any planet which has a carbon cycle, will end up with the same chemical environment globally on its surface. Not only that, these kind of cycles are like thermostats. They control the climate in a very interesting way. You'll have to read the book about the details of how this happens. The interesting thing here now is for the first time now that we go beyond our solar system, we realize that in our solar system, the terrestrial planets have only one cycle, but in general, there are about four that are possible. And so now the question comes back as to would life, the chemistry of life, be different on other planets? If there, are two, if there are four different chemistries, global chemistries on other similar planets, we at least need to do our homework to see whether those global chemistries correspond to possible alternative biochemistries. For example, there is a cycle which is very similar to this one, which is called the sulfur cycle, where you cycle sulfur dioxide, not carbon dioxide. And it occurs when, at the tipping point where the sulfur dioxide concentration is just 10 times larger than what we have on Earth and through Earth's history. So you still have carbon dioxide, but if the sulfur dioxide goes 10 times higher, then the chemical reactions which happen in the formation of carbonates abruptly stopped, and you start forming sulfates. Changes completely the global chemistry on the planet. The planet looks the same. It has oceans, it has uh, continents, it will have similar global temperatures, it will still act as a thermostat, but the chemistry everywhere will change over a period of just a million years. So the rest of its history will be diff different. We don't have an example of that in our solar system, and the chemists who work in biochemistry really want to know uh, whether our biochemistry, which we have here on Earth, can function or emerge on a sulfur cycle planet. And that brings me to that connection between chemical synthetic biology and astronomy. In order to make progress, we can't do it by ourselves. 
the astronomers finding their planets and doing their spectroscopy and the biologists just working on the example of life on Earth. It is the kind of question which requires a team effort which combines all those together. And it is one which gives you already a different view of what life could be uh, in the bigger world of the universe. And if I can come back to that slide of the history of the universe as we know it today, and particularly taking the present day and projecting it into the future, where, as we understand it now, the same dynamical state is going to go on for a long period of time. The stars are not going to form in big numbers anymore, but going to last for a long time. If you look at that state and say how much time there was for all those chemical cycles on planets to get going and to uh, let an emergent biochemistry develop and become part of the global chemistry of a planet, become the planet itself, essentially. What you can say about the future of life is that even if our chemistry is not the first one, we are definitely of the first generation. And I use here generation in the same terms in which we use it in human terms. It is a cohort of peers which are not necessarily all born the same year or even the same decade, but share something common. And what we all probably share on those different planets in different galaxies is that the roots of our tree of life all have chemical roots. The first chemicals that were produced by the first generations of stars in this universe and the first generations of solid planets which had those chemical cycles to allow this to happen. And when and how the next generation is going to come about, this is for the younger of you to find out. Thank you.